you for the invitation. Uh, so my talk will be about scale separation from bootstrapping quantum gravity, which seemed appropriate for this workshop. Um, this is based on a recent paper I had with uh, Fernando Aldai, as well as many papers with him and other authors in the last few years. So let's start with the basic question, what is quantum gravity? So as everyone knows, gravity is a non-renormalizable theory, which means that quantum corrections induce infinite higher derivative corrections to the Einstein-Hilbert action R. So if you write down the action for gravity, um, so here we have LD is a Planck length in D bulk dimensions. And because this is Einstein gravity, the leading term will always be R, the Einstein-Hilbert term. But because this theory is non-renormalizable, there will be infinite higher derivative corrections. So for instance, one such correction you could write as R squared, and then there will be other ones with higher and higher powers of Planck length. Uh, this kappa is a coefficient, which in principle is unknown. And this is why quantum gravity is hard, is that we don't know what these coefficients kappa are. And so if we claim to be quantum gravity theorists, we have to tell people what these coefficients kappa are. And indeed, there are infinite such coefficients, because there are infinite corrections induced by quantum. Um, so have we achieved this? Well, as string theorists, we would probably claim that we have. Uh, because so far, the only known completion with massless particles of spin less than or equal to 2 is string theory, where the bulk dimension is 10, or m theory, where the bulk dimension is 11, and of course, these are related by duality. Now, I specify massless particles of spin less than or equal to 2, because if you relax that, then you could have higher spin gravity, but I won't be discussing that in this talk, um, and that's a little bit further away from physical reality. Um, so, we claim that we have a quantum theory of gravity. But can we actually compute all the corrections to Einstein gravity, which is, in a sense, what quantum gravity is supposed to do? And the problem is that this is hard. Um, so for string theory, we have a world sheet, which in principle allows us to compute these corrections perturbatively in the string coupling. But that does not necessarily allow us to do it at finite string coupling. That's much harder. And for M theory, we don't have an, even an, in principle a method to compute these higher derivative corrections, because there's no world sheet. I mean, another way of understanding it is that M theory is strongly coupled string theory. And when string theory is strongly coupled, we simply don't have a method. So when we claim we have a theory of quantum gravity, you know, we're perhaps slightly exaggerated. So ADS-CFT kind of comes to save the day. So if we discuss quantum gravity, specifically on asymptotically ADS space, then a solution is given by ADS-CFT, which is best understood in the maximally supersymmetric case, which is all I will be discussing today. And so those cases are, M theory on ADS7 cross S4, which is dual to a 3D CFT called ABJM. Type 2B string theory on ADS5 cross S5, which is dual to a 4D CFT called N equals 4 square A mills. And M theory on ADS7 cross S4, which is dual to a 6D theory called 2 comma 0. So the basic ingredient of this dictionary is that scattering of gravitons in ADS is dual to the correlator of the stress tensor multiplet in the CFT. And so, ADS-CFT actually teaches you not just about quantum gravity in ADS, but also about quantum gravity in flat space, which hopefully dispels a common misconception that, you know, we're only learning about quantum gravity in ADS. And the reason we can do this is due to this wonderful formula um, uh, written down by Joao Penedonis, based on the work of many other authors, uh, which tells you very precisely how, starting with scattering of gravitons in ADS, which you can get from the CFT, how you can take a flat limit as the ADS radius goes to infinity, and thereby get the S matrix in just regular flat quantum gravity, which is completely equivalent to knowing the effective action. So the question on the very first slide, which is how do we compute all the corrections to the Einstein-Hilbert term, is in principle solved by ADS-CFT plus this flat limit formula. In principle, assuming that we can in fact solve the CFT completely. But of course, that's easier said than done. There is another problem, though, if we want to learn about quantum gravity, which is physically realistic. And so, in all known cases of ADS-CFT, the radius of the compact spacetime, for instance, the S5 in the n equals 4 super mills case, is the same as the curvature of the ADS. So another way of saying this is that the extra dimensions are large. And this makes these examples unphysical, as we expect in the real world that if we really want to understand our four dimensions by compactifying string theory, we would want the extra dimensions to be really small. We wouldn't want them to be as big as the dimensions we observe. And so the question is, is there a UV complete theory of quantum gravity in ADS with small extra dimensions? Um, which could be understood either from ADS-CFT or maybe just somehow constructing it otherwise. 
And surprisingly, we actually don't know of such an example. So people have made proposals in ADS3, you know, perhaps even in ADS2, uh, but there is no really well accepted proposal of a pure ADS supergravity theory. Um, you know, some people would even claim in the swampland community that it cannot exist. So in this talk, I will show that pure ADS supergravity, which I just define as quantum gravity on ADS with no compact spacetime, saturates the most general conformal bootstrap bounds on ADS graviton scattering as checked in the large N expansion at one loop order. Um, I will furthermore show some evidence that these numerical bounds might be able to in fact define this pure supergravity theory non-perturbatively, i.e. they could fix all the coefficients in the higher derivative corrections to Einstein-Hilbert action, you know, including non-perturbative and Planck length coefficients, although that's a bit more speculative. Okay, so the outline is that I will first introduce some kinematics about the stress tensor correlator and maximally super symmetric CFTs, which restricts me to D equals three, four, and six. I will then discuss how this is related to the small Planck length expansion of the holographic correlator. I will discuss how to get one loop from tree level, and then finally show these numerical bootstrap bounds and discuss the final results. So any questions before we proceed? Great. So let's just start with some simple kinematics, which hopefully people have seen before. Uh, so we're considering the stress tensor four point function. And for simplicity, we can consider the super primary, which is a scalar. And so we take a four point function of this scalar and um, conformal symmetry fixes it in terms of this function G of U and V, where U and V are the usual conformal cross ratios. Um, furthermore, you can expand uh, G of U and V in blocks, in particular super blocks, um, as worked out by these authors. Um, and so as a result, all the non-trivial dynamical information of this four point function is given by these OP coefficients lambda, as well as the scaling dimensions of the various super multiples. And so if we can determine that data, then we know everything about the stress tensor four point function, and we know everything about scattering of gravitons in ADS. So some other general constraints we know about this is unitarity tells us that the OP coefficient squared is positive, and crossing symmetry gives us an infinite set of constraints um, simply because in Euclidean space you can permute these operators. And so U and V is related to V and U with this factor. And so these are the constraints we know without specifying anything about the theory. And so this has to apply to any max, maxly supersymmetric CFT and correspondingly any maxly supersymmetric theory of quantum gravity on ADS in one higher dimension. We haven't made any assumptions, we haven't said anything about string theory, M theory, or, or even you know, whether it's higher spin gravity. Okay, so now let's connect this to the bulk. So it is natural to expand our four point function at large C, which I define to be the coefficient of the canonically normalized stress tensor two point function. The reason why the C is the natural parameter is firstly, from the CFT perspective, conformal ward identities fix it to be inversely proportional to the stress tensor OP coefficient squared. And this allows us to input it into the, age of, into the bootstrap for a general CFT. So we don't have to know anything about the specifics of the theories. This is just a number we can always put in because this operator always exists. Um, the reason why it's a physically interesting property, quantity, is that it counts the degrees of freedom in our theory. So for instance, for n equals four super egg mills with n colors, it would scale like n squared. For ABGM, it would scale like n to the three halves. And for in 60, it would scale like n cubed. It also has a bulk interpretation in that the quantity which is naturally related to the Planck length is C. And it's related by the simple formula. I mean, it's dimensionless. So it's the ratio of the ADS radius to the bulk Planck length to the power D minus two, where this D minus two is simply because this C is what couples to the Einstein-Hilbert term. And so Einstein-Hilbert term has dimension two, and thus this is D minus two. And so this C is how we will naturally go back and forth between CFT parameters and bulk parameters. So there's a very nice program, which was started a few years ago uh, by Rastelli and Zhao, um, which is called the analytic bootstrap sometimes. And it tells you how using very general principles, you're able to severely constrain the small Planck length expansion of um, these holographic correlators. Uh, so in particular, the only inputs to this program are crossing symmetry, supersymmetry, and analyticity, which is another way of saying that at each order in one over C, or alternatively Planck length, only certain Witten diagrams are allowed. So again, this is extremely general and applies pretty much to any theory which would have any kind of gravity-like bulk interpretation. So it's not specifying string theory, M theory, super general. So let's see what happens when we apply this to our four-point function. So at leading order, C goes to infinity. This will just be a generalized free field theory. It's a disconnected term. It's 
completely trivial. Um, at 1 over c, we get the term, which I call tree-level supergravity, which just comes from the Einstein-Hilbert term, thus it's denoted gr. Um, at 1 over c squared, you get a one-loop Witten diagram with two Einstein-Hilbert uh, vertices, which I denote r bar r. Um, and then there's also a uh, contact term whose coefficient is, in principle, unfixed by this method. So this is theory-specific, which I call kappa r bar r. Um, in the lower lines, I show higher derivative correction. Because recall from the first slide that any theory of quantum gravity, because it's dominant normalizable, will have infinite higher derivative corrections. And so in particular, when you have maximal supersymmetry, the first one that appears is r to the 4. Um, and its coefficient, of course, is theory dependent. This is what I call this dr to the 4. Here is other higher derivative corrections. And so the point of the analytic bootstrap, it can't tell us these coefficients b, but it was able to fix the four-point function just in terms of a few coefficients b. So you know, a priori, there was maybe infinite coefficients you had to fix. And if you were trying to compute this thing from some kind of ADS supergravity Lagrangian, it would have been very complicated. But now we see that all we need to do to fix the r to the 4 guy is fix one numerical coefficient. Or for instance, to fix d to the 4 r to the 4, we just need to fix two coefficients, et cetera. Finally, let's discuss the scaling of these higher derivative corrections. So you see you get these funny fractions in powers of c. And this is just based on dimensional analysis. Because as discussed before, c is proportional to a certain power of the Planck length. And so then depending on the bulk dimension, these higher derivative corrections will scale different. Um, so one of the key inputs uh, to uh, the results of today's talk is that there was a method uh, developed uh, by these uh, gentlemen and lady uh, which say how you can get uh, one loop from tree level uh, by essentially an ADS version of the optical theorem. And so whereas the tree level supergravity term is universal, in that it is the same for any theory with massless spin two particles of two or less, and it is not sensitive to the compact factor. So for instance, it would be the same for ADS5 process 5, or ADS5 process 5 mod Z2, or ADS5 with no S5. The first order in which you are sensitive to the compact factor is one loop, because this one loop calculation depends on the KK mode spectrum, which thus depends on this compact factor. Um, now I should note that the method introduced by these people gives you the answer up to contact term ambiguities, and so it doesn't tell you this kappa. Uh, but these contact term ambiguities only affect a small subset of physical observables the vast majority are unaffected by. Um, okay, so this is basically what I just said. So let's give an example. Um, so let's look at a theory which is related to M-theory, which has bulk dimension 11, and let's imagine we've compactified it. Um, sure. Um, well, no, it would change. No, yeah, so, so right now here I'm assuming that you only have massless spins two or less. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's what I, I briefly said that on the previous slide. You could do a separate analytic bootstrap allowing for higher spins, uh, which we have also done. Uh, but I, I won't be discussing that at the moment. Um, and I'll comment a little bit later that when you have maximal supersymmetry, uh, well, I can also just say that. When you have maximal supersymmetry, there are, as far as we know, no higher spin interacting theories. Um, and so that's why it's not really relevant. But I, I can discuss that more at the end. Um, so like the... Um, well, I mean, it's a, it's a whole different expansion in that case. I mean, because like also like this GR term would be completely different. Because you would have single trace Witten diagrams for every spin, not just, you know, spin 0, 1, and 2. And then the high, and like, and even, I mean, yeah, high derivative corrections, I'm sure would also be different as well. But, but it's, but it just, it doesn't exist for maximal supersymmetry. So it's not relevant to this talk, but I'll discuss it briefly at the end once you relax maximal supersymmetry. Uh, but yeah, th thank you for the question. Um, okay, so uh, let's give the example of M theory on ADS4 cross S7, dual to 3D ABGM. So uh, as, as mentioned, the first two terms are universal. So like just usual disconnected, it's tree level supergravity. Um, now, the first higher derivative correction is r to the 4. It scales like minus 5 thirds. You have the one loop. You have these other higher derivatives. Um, now, because M theory is putatively a UV complete theory of quantum gravity, that means in principle, all these coefficients v should be fixable from M theory. So if we were smart enough, and if we knew everything about M theory in 11 dimensions, we would just compactify, and then we would just read off all these v's and kappas, and that would be it. But of course, uh, we don't know that. I mean, we actually know extremely little about M theory. Um, uh, so, what we've been able to do so far is using the constraints of supersymmetric localization for the 3D ABGM theory, we've been able to fix some of these lowest protected terms. So, in particular, we've been able to fix the higher derivative corrections up to d to the 4 to the 4 in various papers, 
And it's conceivable that we might be able to additionally get d to the 6 r to the 4. But that's the last protected higher derivative term. Beyond d to the 6 r to the 4, we do not expect that localization will be able to give us further terms. And so for that, we really need a more powerful method, such as the numerical boost. Um, let's give another example. Now let's talk about instead of ADS4 cross S7, dual temp theory, let's just do ADS4 with no S7 factor. And so in this case, using our general formula and plugging in D equals 4, so as usual, the first three terms are universal, they stay the same, but one loop is now different, thus I put a tilde on it. And now we observe that the R to the 4 correction shows up at a much higher order. In fact, it's degenerate with the um, free loop term here. So it's very suppressed. Um, and so, in particular, you know, just to reemphasize, this one loop term is different from ADS4 cross the 7 versus ADS4, because they have a different KK mode spectrum, and so you just get a different result. And so, whereas the ADS4 cross the 7 result uh, was computed in these two papers with these authors, the ADS4 result is the one computed in the paper which this talk is mostly about. Um, and so, I just want to emphasize that when I say pure ADS supergravity, I'm not saying, like, literally there's only an Einstein-Hilbert term and there's no higher derivative corrections. Of course, there are always higher derivative corrections. There are infinite corrections. I'm saying that pure supergravity is the theory, which has only one KK mode, and I don't know the coefficients of these higher derivative corrections, but in principle, they will be some numbers. And in practice, perhaps we will read them from the numerical bootstrap results today. Okay. So that concludes the discussion of this large C expansion of the four-point function, which is equivalently the small Planck length expansion, which is equivalently the corrections to the um, Einstein equations. And so everything I discussed so far just applied to any um, theory uh, which has mass of spin two particles or less, and it only depended on the bulk dimension. Um, now I will discuss totally general results from the numerical bootstrap. So these apply to any maxly supersymmetric C of T, and I can compute them as a function of C by inputting it in using the conformal word identity. So I should note that this subject was originated by these authors back in 2013, originally in 4D, then uh, with a couple more authors, they did it in 60, and then uh, me with some other authors, we did it in 3D. So these are the three cases we're gonna discuss. So what, what does the bootstrap give you? So it allows you to compute upper bounds on scaling dimensions of unprotected multiples, and it allows you to compute both upper and lower bounds, i.e. islands, on OP coefficients of certain multiples. Now, I should note that you can't always get both upper and lower bounds. You can only get a lower bound if the protected multiple that you're looking at is separated from the possible continuum of unprotected multiples. So it's kind of a technical thing, but it will matter for some of the bounds we show. But in some cases, you can actually get both upper and lower bounds. And so you may have seen uh, talks before, maybe on bootstrapping the IC model, where they were able to get islands on scaling dimensions. And so for these supersymmetric theories, you can get similar islands on OP coefficients uh, kind of in a much easier way. Um, so the most important thing about the bootstrap, you know, relative to other numerical non-perturbative methods, like say, you know, lattice methods or something like that, is that these bounds improve monotonically as a function of the finite truncation of the infinite dimensional crossing equations as parameterized by capital lambda. And so this is what makes these bounds rigorous. Because if they did not improve monotonically, then it would not be guaranteed that the bounds you got with one truncation would be the same as the bounds you got with a different truncation. They could fluctuate. And so this is like a super important aspect. I mean, for many people, this is maybe the most attractive aspect of the bootstrap. So that in some sense, every bootstrap run you do, numerical though it might be, it is, an, it is a theorem. Because you are rigorously showing a bound on CFD. Uh, so here, we apply the numerical bootstrap uh, to compute these numerical bounds in C of T's of dimension 3, 4, and 6 using mu a much bigger truncation than previous studies with uh, sufficiently big such that the results are extremely well converged. Because in general, when you go to higher space-time dimensions, convergence is an issue. Uh, this is something which plagued kind of earlier studies from maybe roughly 10 years ago, and I think this is overcome in our recent work, mostly through brute force. Okay, so um, without further ado, here are the results. Um, I should note this is a subset of the results. There are more in the paper, but for a short talk, I'll just show one from each dimension. So let's start in 4D, or let's start in general. So in all these plots, the x-axis is 1 over C, because C is the universal parameter we can always put in. And I'm doing 1 over C, and I'm looking at very large C, because that is the regime which is related to small Planck length, and that's the regime where we have a gravity-like description. So that's what we want to look at. That's also the regime where we can compare it to these 1 over C corrections. So 
These are bounds, so the y-axis is various CFD data. So in 4D, we're looking at a certain unprotected scaling dimension. Um, so this is a certain spin two operator. Um, in uh, 3D, we're looking at a certain semi-short OPE coefficients. We have both upper and lower bounds. And then in 6D, this is another unprotected scaling dimension. Um, this light blue is the allowed region. So here it's an upper bound, upper and lower bounds, upper bound. And this black line denotes uh, just the bound given by the bootstrap. So it's this non-perturbative, totally universal bound. The other lines, uh, which hopefully you can see, it's a little bit blurry here. Uh, so these describe these one over C analytic calculations. So the gray line, which unfortunately is very hard to see here, is the tree level correction. And so remember, the tree level correction is universal in that it is not, it's not sensitive to the compact factor. And so it's the same whether or not you're looking at ADS5 process 5, ADS5 process 5 mod Z2, or pure ADS5, which are the three cases with massive supersymmetry. And so here we see that at very large C, this gray line is right on top of the black line, such that you probably can't even tell the difference. And so this is kind of a nice consistency check. And so this shows that it seems like gravity-like theories are extremely close to saturating these general bounds in the super large C regime, which of course didn't have to happen because we are just looking at crossing applied to a single four-point function. And you know, if you would have asked somebody about this 30 years ago, they would have said there's no way that any physical theory would have even been remotely close to these general bounds. And so that, that already is a very nice result. And this is something which was already observed, you know, by Leonardo et al., you know, I guess eight years ago when they first uh, wrote their paper. Um, and it's a similar phenomenon in 3D and 6D. You also see that this lower bound is right on top of the gray line, again, so that you can barely even see the difference, and similarly in 6D. Now, things get interesting, though, once you go away from super large C and go to merely large C, such that you can start telling the difference between this 1 over C squared correction. And so these colored lines, purple, blue, and orange are adding the 1 over C squared correction to the 1 over C correction. And so there, it's now theory specific. And so what you now see is that starting in 4D, you see that the ADS5 process 5 and the ADS5 process 5 mod Z2 are both now within the allowed region. They are no longer hugging this most general bound. Whereas the pure ADS5 correction improves the tree level bound such that it continues to hug the general bound. Now, unfortunately, due to this projector, it's a little hard to see, but if you really squint, you can see there's a gray line, which is now below the black line, and then there's an orange line, which is above it and continues to be exactly on this bound. But even with a not ideal projector, you can see that blue and purple are clearly well within the allowed region. Um, and it's the exact same phenomenon in every other dimension. So, so, so 3D is probably the easiest to see visually. So you can see that this gray line, as C gets uh, smaller, is now in this disallowed region, and this orange line is literally right on top of the black line, whereas blue and purple are just somewhere in the allowed region. Um, 60 is the hardest to see. Uh, I mean, you can clearly see that gray is eventually outside, but it's a little bit harder to see between uh, blue, purple, and orange. I mean, orange and blue in particular are very close to each other. But I think it's compelling that in every single space-time dimension we have looked at, and furthermore, in all the CFT data we have looked at, I mean, I'm just showing you one example from each dimension, but there are other examples in our paper, we always find the same phenomenon which it is always the pure ADS theory, which is saturating the bound in this reasonably large C regime, and not these other theories which have known string and M theory duals. So this is, I would say, uh, the main results of this talk, although I will explain it more in the coming slides. So, uh, question? I'm not saying anything about lambda. This is a Planck length expansion. Ah, no, this is fixed lambda. I, I, don't, I, I don't trust extrapolations. And be very careful about extrapolations when it comes to numerics. But this is high enough lambda that I'm very confident that things are converged. Like, certainly by I, you would not see any changes by increasing capital lambda beyond this. Uh, another question? Uh, yeah, so the one, the one that's furthest out is, is, is just S. The one that's a bit closer, oh, sorry, sorry. The one that's closest to the bound is pure. The one that's second closest is mod Z2, and the one that's farthest is no mod Z2. So I guess like the general pattern you could say is that as you have fewer and fewer KK modes, you get closer and closer to the bell. Oh, uh, well, these are the only orbifolds which preserve maximal supersymmetry. Was it guaranteed that gravity would satisfy the bound, or was it logically possible that it would get rolled out from this? So I think it's guaranteed that perturbatively it would have to be in the allowed region, uh, because as an effective theory, it's totally kosher. 
Now, um, whether or not it's consistent as a non-perturbative theory is not guaranteed. And so, I mean, this is always the subtle thing, is that like these bounds are non-perturbative, right? And so, like, in principle, the non-perturbative corrections could be quite big, and they could have killed the theory, even, say, for C equal to a billion, you know, because we don't know how big these non-perturbative corrections are. Um, but you could say that, like, you know, if we were, like, you know, from a literal, you know, from a mathematical 1 over C uh, calculation, this theory should be allowed at each order of 1 over C. But I mean, you're doing a particular bootstrap condition with particular numerical methods. Was it clear that that method would allow gravity? It was, it is not clear, it, it was not obvious um, rigorously because this is a non-perturbative bound. And so it could have been that non-perturbative corrections would have been so big that we would have already seen this theory excluded, like, even in the super large C regime simply because we don't know what these non-perturbative corrections are. Um, yeah, so, so, I mean, even that's not trivial, and that's really something which was due to the original authors. I mean, like, they're the ones who first noticed that at, like, super large C. I mean, even the fact that C equals infinity gives you the generalized free field theory, well, okay, maybe that was guaranteed, you know, but the moment you go away from the generalized free field theory, the fact that it was, you know, right along the boundary was a non-trivial result. Yeah. Indeed. Well, okay. I mean, uh, I was, there's different kinds of stuff. I, I was saying you should be careful when you have a result which is changing due to some parameter and then extrapolating the parameter to infinity. Um, so this, this result isn't going to change. Uh, what you're talking about is like, does perturbation theory describe reality? And so I would say that in physics in general, we seem to believe it does, because in the LHC, we compute, say, you know, physical observables perturbatively in alpha prime, or alpha, whatever they call it, and indeed it seems to match reality. So, so I think that even though quantum field theory is mostly an asymptotic expansion, it seems to work reasonably well, and I, that's the same principle here. So I, I think it's safe to say that in a large enough regime of C, we can reasonably trust these results, and this seems borne out by the experimental observation. Yeah. No, but I mean, but, but that. Well, but that's all. We're looking at an intermediate range. You know, it's like it's like imagine we had two theories of electrodynamics, and they had the same answer at order alpha, and they differed at order alpha squared. So then we do an experiment at the LHC, and we want to look at a regime of sensitivity which is like between alpha and alpha squared. And so you could have the same objection, but like, you know, I think it's reasonable that there's some intermediate regime where you don't have to look where alpha cubed is too small, but you know, you can tell the difference between the alpha squared. And so it's just just the same idea here. Anyways. So, so these are the most general bootstrap bounds with no assumptions, and the result is that the pure supergravity theory is on the bound. So what if we want to look at a, a theory with a known string theory dual, like n equals 4 super grand mills? Are, are we out of luck? Can we just not study that theory? Well, thankfully, there is another non-perturbative method called supersymmetric localization, which can be added to the bootstrap to find uh, the theory we want. So in particular, there are two exact localization constraints derived in these papers, which we can input for SUN n equals 4 super mills for any value of n. These bounds are specifying to n equals 2, although we could do other values of n. And these inputs depend on the complexified coupling tau. And so now they allow you to do a bound as a function of tau. So in these plots, the y-axis is what you call the Konishi at weak coupling. And the x-axis is the uh, usual Yang-Mills coupling. Um, and this orange region is the new allowed region, now with bootstrap and localization. And uh, the beautiful result is that in the weak coupling regime, we can compare it to known results computed by many people, such as this Belajanin. And if you look at the for loop result, it seems to exactly track our upper bound. And so this is very compelling evidence that once you add localization inputs to bootstrap, you were able to really pinpoint known gauge theories. Um, and so this is a plot in the regime of like small to strong coupling. Here's a plot that also shows the dependence on the theta angle. Of course, there we don't have anything to compare to. But I think this is very exciting because this is the first step towards truly not perturbatively solving a gauge theory, which I don't think anyone's been able to do before. Um, and so the other interesting aspect of this is that you could ask a question, is there any value of tau for which this improved bound would have coincided with the more general bound for which we did not put localization in? Uh, for that, indeed, was the original conjecture of Rosselli et al. in their paper, that, you know, they didn't know how to put in tau, but they thought perhaps there's some special value of tau, such as like, you know, a self-dual point, which would have corresponded to their general bound. And one thing we learn is that the answer is no. Because even for the, you know, the highest upper bound right around here, you know, right around this, you know, self-dual point, there's still a gap. Um, and so this shows that the most general bounds are not corresponding to n equals 4 super egg mills, even when n is small. 
because notice n is 2 here. This is the smallest possible value of c. And so on the previous uh, transparency, I showed you that at large c, n equals 4 sweet green mills was not saturating the bound. And now I've also shown you that at the smallest value of c, n equals 4 sweet green mills is not saturating the most general bound. Um, so I, I think this is evidence that perhaps what is saturating this bound is uh, the most general one, could be pure radius supergravity, some non-perturbative you know, version of it, um, even at finite. I, and so there's a similar story with 3D. I, I'll make this kind of quick. So here in this case, the y-axis is a certain protected OP coefficient. This can be computed using localization. And here we compare these known analytic results to these various colors, to the bootstrap bounds, to the black colors. And again, we show that even though at very large C, they seem to coincide, at small C, there is a gap showing that the known theories just don't correspond to the bound, kind of analogous to n equals 4. Um, and then similar to n equals 4, after you put in localization, we were able to find the theory on the bound. It's a similar thing with ABGM. This plot's a little bit messy, but the, the basic idea is that these black lines are the, are the general, are like the gray lines were the general bootstrap bounds. Black lines were after we put in this localization OP coefficient, and after putting that in, we now find that the one-loop correction for ABGM is very close to saturating this improved bound. So in conclusion, we have shown that the large C expansion of holographic correlators is fixed by the analytic bootstrap in terms of a few coefficients, and the most general bootstrap bounds for maximally supersymmetric CFTs are saturated by pure ADS supergravity in the large C regime, and not theories that are dual to string and M theory. Um, and you know, as people asked, you know, as an effective theory, of course, you could always define this, and so maybe you should have seen it. The really interesting question is if this pure ADS supergravity exists at finite C, and very intriguingly, we have found some evidence in both 3D and 4D that the, the known string M theory CFTs cannot be saturating the most general bounds in, in that case as well. And so this suggests that maybe this pure ADS supergravity theory exists non-perturbatively and continues to saturate the bound at finite C. Um, if you want to look at known theories, you can kill the pure guy by inputting localization results which are theory specific, in which case we then find evidence that the improved bounds are saturated by string M theory duals, such as N equals four spring mills and ABGM. Um, and in principle, something we'd like to do in the future is get precise enough numerics such that you could just read off from these curves, say for N equals four spring mills or ABGM, these higher derivative corrections, thereby allowing us to define the SMH fixed all orders and thus allowing us to define quantum gravity properly to all orders, not just protected terms. So, uh, so that's the first future direction, get these unprotected terms like D to date R to the four, perhaps by using new localization constraints. Um, we would, uh, so far I've mostly been discussing 3D and 4D. 60 is a little bit trickier, there's no localization, but in a nice paper I had with Eric a number of years ago, we showed there's something kind of analogous to localization, which allows you to compute the non-trivial OP coefficient, and so maybe that would allow us to also zero in on the 2 comma 0 theory. Um, it would also be nice just to compute uh, higher loop terms in the pure ADS theory to see if this continues saturating for a bigger and bigger regime, um, which should be possible, and in fact easier than the ADS 5 process 5 case. Um, I should also note there was a nice uh, paper on the subject by um, Kubu, Miguel, and Martin, uh, where they note that you can take the flat limit of our pure ADS theory and it would have a global symmetry. So you would have flat space quantum gravity with a global symmetry, basically because the R symmetry wouldn't be like geometrized. Um, and so this uh, is very troubling to people who believe in the, in the, you know, no, no global symmetry conjecture, but I would just remind everybody that is a conjecture. And so it would be very surprising if it was false, but it could be false. Um, finally, the last comment I want to make is that uh, there was a question about higher spin gravity. So with maximal supersymmetry, there are just are no interacting higher spin gravity theories. Um, in 3D, though, if you relax supersymmetry from n equals 8 to n equals 6, then higher spin gravity theories exist. They are, they are called ABJ theories with uh, this gauge group in the large n uh, limit. And we, in fact, showed in, a, in another numerical bootstrap study by comparing some localization data to bootstrap that these higher spin gravity theories now saturate the most general bounds. So it seems that the bootstrap wants to be saturated by higher spin gravity, and it's only saturated by regular gravity if there just is no higher spin gravity around. And another way of saying that in CFT language is that the bootstrap wants to be saturated by vector degrees of freedom, and it's only saturated by non-vector degrees of freedom if there just aren't any theories with vector degrees of freedom. And so I think this is intriguing because interacting vector models, i.e. interacting higher spin gravity, this only exists for ADS4 CFT3. In ADS5 CFT4, there just aren't any interacting vector models. And so this suggests that if we were to remove supersymmetry in the 4D CFT, and do a bootstrap of the stress tensor without any supersymmetry, 
as a function of C and compare it to you know, Witten diagrams, we might very well find that pure gravity in ADS-5 is saturating the bounds without any need for supersymmetry. So uh, that's it. Thanks, Shai. Uh, we have uh, some time for questions. Can I just ask you to remind us, uh, what is the status of mixed correlators in N equals 4? Did people do? Um, yes. So um, people, okay, so this, it depends which correlators you're mixing. Um, so the simplest choice would be to mix half BPS operators. That's the easiest guy. So you could mix, say, the stress tensor with the next lowest KK mode. That was indeed done originally by Alessandro Vicky, Agnes Abisi, and Andrea uh, Menenti. Um, and they actually found that it did not really improve things so much. Um, and, and, the, and that's kind of a general bootstrap story, which is like, you know, it's like the price of success, where it's like the fact that you're able to get such nice bounds just by one correlator oftentimes means that adding correlators doesn't really change the results so much. Um, and a related comment is that usually the correlators that affect things the most are those whose external operators have the lowest dimension. But for these half PPS guys, the dimension kind of is getting bigger very quickly, you know, in integer steps. And so maybe that's why it's expected that these mixed correlators don't change things so much. Um, but there's another mixed correlator system, which I think would be much more powerful. So instead of mixing the stress tensor with its next KK mode, which is, you know, dimension three, you can mix it with the Konishi. Because indeed, we know at weak coupling that, you know, the lowest dimension operators are the stress tensor and then the Konishi. Um, and so uh, that is much more challenging because you would have to compute blocks corresponding to long multiplets. Uh, but that's something we're working on, and we were hoping that uh, doing mixed correlators of, you know, Konishi with the stress sensor might allow us to get islands um, for n equals 4 as a function of tau. Have you looked at the um, extremal spectrum for the correlator that saturates the bounds at finite C? And if so, does it have some simple structure? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, so, so um, uh, what the, the questioner is referring to uh, is that uh, with the numerical bootstrap, you know, if the, if the theory is like right on the boundary, then you can in principle read off all the CFT data in the four point function, not just the specific thing you're bounding. Um, and um, so uh, I did that a little bit. It's just, that it's always more of an art than a science. Yeah. where it's like you have to have like really, really, really precise bounds to be confident about the spectrum. And like we already really had to push the bootstrap to super high precision even to get like convergence, say in 60 and 40. So I'm not yet confident enough to make claims based on the spectrum, but that's certainly something we'd like to do in the future. Okay, thanks. I have a, a non-expert question. Sure. Um, so given the fact that at infinite C, there's a global symmetry, yeah. And I, I would say, by the way, that global symmetry is way less a conjecture than ADS-CFTs at this point. Um, is there a certain bootstrap bound which can sort of really, is, is sort of tailored at seeing a possible inconsistency when there's a global symmetry? Okay, so, so yeah, so it's a great question, which is that like, say we believe this conjecture that there is no flat space quantum gravity with the global symmetry. How could we see that? Like, what would go wrong in the bootstrap uh, which would, you know, like, you know, be related to this idea. And so this would probably be sensitive to stuff about black holes, would be my guess. And black hole states, as they appear in scattering of gravitons, uh, would correspond to very high dimension operators, internal operators. And so we would have to have a precise enough bootstrap such that we could look at not just like, say, the lowest dimension operator in a given sector, which is the bounds I was showing you, but say like the fifth lowest dimension operator or something like that. Like an operator whose scaling dimension scales like C. And so it'll very large. And so it is conceivable that once the bootstrap gets that precise and we could look at the spectrum, as Scott was saying, maybe we would find some kind of like anomalies um, or, or maybe simply this theory would just start being disallowed because maybe once it's sensitive enough to be sensitive to black holes, it would, it would then die. Um, and so, yeah, so, yeah, so I mean, you, you, you can look at these results in two ways. Either um, if you are crazy, you could say like there really does exist pure supergravity, not perturbatively, and uh, the no-global symmetry conjecture is wrong. Um, or if maybe you're more reasonable, you could say like, oh, it's right, but we need, but this is telling us where we need to look to see how it emerges. Thanks. In, in that argument about global symmetry, ends being taken to strictly to infinity, where gravity decouples, which is something I find confusing about it. But um, you, you're saying because, like, when they talk about this, this flat limit. Yeah. So well, but, but, I, I think. Um, but you I mean, but, but couldn't you do this, you know, perturbatively? I mean, you could take the flat space limit order by order in one over C, right? 
But the theory is okay at the first non-trivial order. Consistent sure. truncations exist. So yeah, that's another you, confusion about that. But you can also take the flat limit of the one-loop term or higher terms. I mean, you could, you, but by taking n to infinity as your flat space limit, gravity is decoupling, so it's hard to apply gravity arguments. Um, so sorry, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure I understand that. I mean, like the standard flat space limit, you can do order by order, and you can indeed compare one loop in ADS, one loop mm -hmm. in flat space. You can compare the R to the four correction in ADS, the R to the four correction in flat space. I mean, you can do it for, for any order. I mean, it, it might yeah. be, I, I agree, it's hard to maybe understand non perturbative corrections. Um, so maybe Giraud can answer this, but I don't know if there's, I don't know if the flat space limit would ever be able to tell you about like e to the minus c, e to the minus one over c terms in the CFT, how to relate those to the ball. I'm, but, I mean, I think you can take a kinematic flat space limit? Order Sorry. by order and one over n, you, you can take a kinematic flat space limit of some amplitude, it's true. Yeah. But just at the level of the argument leading to the global symmetry thing, n is being taken strictly to infinity. That's the flat space limit that's being done there. And then it's hard to see how to use a gravity argument. But I actually want to ask you about this. So can you yeah. go back to your, your plots for a second? Sure. Um, no, which one? No, 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 I guess forward, the... forward, 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 forward. Uh. Oh, sorry. Opposite <laughs> okay. The one over C plots. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. Th th these guys. Yeah, yeah, okay. thanks. So, so there's a leap of faith here because we're taking these one loop results and we're looking at this finite, large but finite C region and we're noting which line is closer to the bootstrap bound. Yes. So I want to understand better. So, so your, your conjecture is that if we were to look at a thousand loop order, yeah. that, that would still be true. The pure ADS line would still be closer. To well, the I mean, it's an asymptotic line. expansion. It's like. Like, say, you know, people compute, I don't know, the fine structure, con like, you know, expansion of the fine structure constant to, like, a billion orders compared to the LHC. Will that continue matching the LHC? I mean, I don't know. I mean, like, well, if, like if, let's forget know. about the LHC. Let's yeah. just talk about this for a second. <laughs> I mean, okay, I mean, it's like, like, so if I, yeah. if I, if I had a thousand loop data, yeah. your claim is that the pure ADS case would be closer to the black line? No, is that right? because at a thousand loop order, it's an asymptotic series, it might just become total garbage. So like, why are we looking at finite C? Well, I mean, again, it's like, with a one like I mean, line. what one does in general in quantum field theory is that you compute things perturbatively. They are asymptotic series. And so we don't believe that they will work, you know, to a thousand loop order, but usually to a few loop order. They give good approximations and we then compare them to phenomenon in reality, which always exists at finite coupling. And so it's the exact same story here. And yeah, this happens sort of on a case by case basis with a given observable. And then there's a yeah. question, how far down you can push it? So you're sort of conjecturing no you can push it yeah. far down. That's yeah, so I have no idea. Um, it is a good question of like, I guess this, you could say like, what is the resurgence of this one over C expansion? I don't think anything's known about that. Um, one thing I can say though, is that in the 6D plot, this plot is the entire regime of allowed C. So the smallest value of, that's known for 62 comma zero theories is C equals 25, that's the A1 theory, that corresponds to one over C being 0 0.04. And so it seems like this one over C expansion is so good that once you include one loop, it seems to match the bound for the entire regime of allowed C. And so it seems that surprisingly, this one over C expansion works way better than you might've even expected. Um, but yeah, but of course I can't, I can't answer the question of like, when does an asymptotic series get bad? But, but do you know if you put like two loops? That's an excellent question. That's something we'd like to do. Yeah, so, so. That's a better question than a thousand loop, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it was just a comment to, perhaps if you, instead of plotting like this, you would like uh, subtract the disconnected and the three level. Yeah. And divide and multiply by C and then extrapolate, then you wouldn't have these objections, I guess, right? Because then you would really measure the coefficient of. The sure. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's a different way. It's a different would way of. Would that be better? If... Well, but I mean, now you really go to C equals infinity, which was. I mean, it's, it's a different way of showing the data. And indeed, we do that in the paper uh, in the sense that we do a fit, a one over C fit, and we show the results of that fit without cheating. Um, and you can compare the, the numerical coefficients we get to the predictions, and they seem to match pretty accurately, I would say. Thanks. Uh, you're showing some data for twist four operator uh, in the uh, generalist free theory, right? The delta zero two for, uh, for dimension? Yeah, yeah. So this is like the lowest twist unprotected guy. Yeah. Do you know what happened for twist six? What uh, is, um, you see, saying for like the, the, the non yeah. Swiss guys, yeah. yeah so I was so, wondering if uh, whether the fact that you are very close to the bound has to do with a mixing, since uh, uh, you're just considering well, okay, so, I mean, and so, not so, so I mean, in general, like, I mean, I think I've looked at the lowest twists in the past in various dimensions. Yeah, usually you can get the second lowest twist to be pretty accurate as well. Uh, usually it's once you go to the third lowest twist, at least when I look at this a few years ago, it starts getting worse. But, I mean, indeed, it would be great to get higher precision and look at the spectrum, not just the lowest twist. Um, but they, they would certainly be separated. I mean, like, because looking at the large C regime, 
like, you know, the kind of mixing you're referring to, that would happen at very small c. So like, for instance, if you were looking at the smallest value of c in 4D, then you would have like, you know, mixing between like single trace and double trace operators. Um, and so like in particular in SU2 superior mills, uh, we expect that the second lowest dimension operator, there should be two of them, and then like they should be degenerate at zero coupling and then become a little bit separate. Uh, but in, but in, in large C, the story is much simpler because you just have double trace operators and they're they are separated very cleanly. Um, sure. Sure. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So yeah. So 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 you do you do have two, and you would expect those to be identical at very large C and at smaller C for there to be two different ones. And that is indeed something that would be nice to look at once we have further proceedings. I think let's, we should proceed. So let's thank Shai again.